All right. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, it is with my great pleasure that I introduce Luke Allen. So he grew up in Asheville and then came here to NC State as an undergrad. Um, and he did his undergraduate degree in meteorology with a minor in statistics, graduated in 2018, uh, summa cum laude, and then went off to University of Illinois to get his master's degree, worked with uh, Dr. Sonia Lasher Trapp on uh, numerical modeling of entrainment, and then um, were able to entice him to return to the program here in geospatial analytics. Um, so came back August, 2020, um, since he's been here, he's been very, very productive. Um, in addition to his thesis work and coursework, he also did two, uh, several actually field deployments um, as part of the Perils campaign uh, with uh, Dr. Parker uh, operating a mobile mesonet in uh, severe weather. Uh, and then he also went to uh, several deployments of the Impacts Winter Storms Project serving both as a forecaster and an aircraft scientist. Um, since he's been here, he's also mentored several undergrad students, several of whom are here today. Um, and he's a lead author on uh, publications related to his thesis. One's already accepted, one's about to be submitted, and another one is um, getting close to being submitted. And he's also co-author on two papers and several more uh, in preparation. Um, okay, so he's a big basketball fan, um, and actually went to the final four this year. Um, and once at the end of the summer, he's going to be moving to Sweden to do a postdoc at the University of Stockholm, um, to do cloud resolving simulations of deep convection. Um, and I'd also like to welcome his brother and father who made the trip here to be, be with us today. Um, I also want to thank the Center for Geospatial Analytics for all their support and help over the years and for providing the wonderful spread. Um, so Luke's done a tremendous amount of work. The presentation today will be about 45 minutes. We'll cover highlights from two parts of his work, then we'll take questions from the general audience. And when that's done, we'll dismiss the general audience and then we'll have further questioning uh, from the committee. So thank you very much. And I'll turn it over to Luke. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Dr. Uter. And I want to thank everyone for attending, of course, including my committee members, uh, Dr. Del Bonenstiel, Dr. Brian Colley, here, who is here with us on Zoom, and Dr. Matt Parker. Um, as Dr. Uter mentioned, I'm going to be talking about my work uh, related to observed air pressure waves and the characteristics of clouds in the context of winter storm structures. So I'm gonna start with just some very basic motivation why we care about this work. Uh, heavy snow due to winter storms, of course, can bring about severe societal impacts, including, you know, for example, downed trees, which can affect the power grid, as well as impacts on uh, transportation networks, like, uh, hazards on roads, as well as to aviation. And so we want to be able to forecast these heavy snow events well in order to prepare and mitigate some of these impacts. Um, however, this is a challenge in part due to the fact that there's often a sharp gradient in the uh, snowfall maps, for example. Um, in this case, you know, 100 kilometers separates a region that got a foot of snow from a region that got no snow at all. And so if numerical models have, say, an error in this heavy snow region of 100 kilometers, that can lead to um, a huge amount of error in the forecast snowfall. And so we want to better understand what produces the mass of snow so that numerical weather models can uh, represent those processes better. In this talk, I'm going to be focusing on what we're terming flatland winter storms. Um, we're calling them flatland winter storms, even though they can also occur over ocean. Um, but we are distinguishing this from, say, lake effect or terrain affected winter storms. These storms are characterized by surface lows. So in the left schematic, um, there are gray contours of surface pressure, where the minimum in surface pressure is indicated by the L symbol and associated air mass boundaries. So the 
Uh, these are the cold front and the warm front, cold front protruding south from the low and warm front protruding east. On the right, this is what that might look like in a satellite image of a winter storm, where again, we have a low pressure center over the ocean, where there's also a cold front and a warm front and flow goes cyclo cyclonically near the surface or counterclockwise around low. So we might often get um, airflow that impinges on the warm front and is forced upward and uh, counterclockwise around. Then we may often get uh, heavy snow on the northwest side of the low. So I'm distinguishing this from orographic winter storms where uh, topography can force upward air motion. So on the right is a radar observed cross section of uh, winter storm over terrain, where on the left side on the bottom, we're showing uh, upward and downward velocities. So the blue indicates that air is flowing upward over the terrain from left to right, and the red indicates uh, downward motion on the right side of the terrain. And so this influences the radar reflectivity shown in the top panel where we get more production of precipitation uh, where that upward motion is. Lake effect winter storms are also excluded from this analysis. Um, these are cases where we get cold flow over warm water, uh, which can lead to a surface-based instability and upward heat and moisture fluxes. But we're gonna be talking about flatland winter storms and how we can improve understanding of the processes and environments associated with uh, production of snow mass as well as decreases in snow mass, uh, specifically in the Northeast US and Southern Canada. I'm gonna split the rest of this talk into two main components. So the first part, we're gonna talk about gravity waves and whether they are associated with uh, enhanced reflectivity in snow. I will define what those words mean in the next few slides. And then the second part, we're gonna talk about uh, the vertical motions in winter storms, how often and at what scales we see strong enough updrafts to loft snow particles. So part one, are gravity waves commonly associated with enhanced reflectivity in snow? To define what gravity waves are, these are waves in the atmosphere that occur in stable layers. Um, they are sort of ubiquitous throughout the atmosphere. They happen in all sorts of environments. Um, they can be propagating or stationary. So in the top left is a diagram showing flow over terrain, which leads to these uh, oscillating motions, uh, gravity waves, which are terrain locked. So these do not move. Um, regardless, they generally yield no net movement of the fluid. Um, and so they're analogous in that way to waves on a water surface. These bottom two images in this slide on the left, I'm showing uh, striations in a cloud field over a marine environment caused by gravity waves. And on the right is a case over land where we get these sort of roll type clouds associated with gravity waves. To see what these look like in an idealized framework, uh, this is sort of a simulation of idealized gravity waves where we're looking at a vertical cross section. And so in each panel, uh, horizontal distance is on the X and vertical is on the Y. Depending on what the sort of trigger of the gravity wave is, whether it's a short pulse, we might get solitary waves propagating outward from where that pulse occurred. If there's more of a steady long-term source, we could get a bore, which does in fact lead to a net displacement of fluid. Or if there are repeated um, pulses, that could lead to a periodic wave train or series of waves propagating outward. And so I wanna focus on that last example to think about what might happen to an air parcel in that gravity wave. So an air parcel is this abstract sort of volume of air within the atmosphere we think of. And so if a gravity wave were to propagate through here, the effect on the parcel would be that it might get perturbed upward or downward. Once, Once it's perturbed, any feedback? Somebody on mute? Okay. Um, once we get that upward perturbation, the parcel is going to cool and gain a downward acceleration due to buoyancy. And then if it's perturbed downward, it will warm and gain an upward acceleration due to buoyancy. And so while we term these gravity waves, it is actually the buoyancy of the parcel that is the restoring force leading to the oscillation. 
And then I also want to define these terms cloud size and precipitation size particles. So cloud size particles are very small water droplets or ice crystals, which have um, roughly zero terminal fall velocity, meaning that they move with the air parcel that they're within. Whereas precipitation size ice has a terminal fall velocity and will therefore fall out of the air parcel. Um, and if we think about typical sizes, so a cloud size particle might be 0.01 millimeters. Precipitation size is gonna be at least 0.2 millimeters in diameter. And if we think of snow, that's gonna fall at about one meter per second, give or take half a meter per second. And for reference, cloud si or a precipitation size particles larger than 0.2 millimeters versus a credit card thickness of 0.7. So it's about a third of the size before you get a third of the size of the thickness of a credit card before you start to get particles falling. So how might gravity waves increase the snow mass? We thought about this in this chain of processes going from left to right here. So I'm gonna walk through that. We might start with gravity waves being triggered and propagating into a region with cloud like a winter storm. And then depending on what type of cloud is present, we might have an ice only cloud, a liquid water only cloud, or a mixture of the two. We could get in the upward motions with gravity waves, enhanced ice growth um, due to vapor deposition. So the conversion from water vapor to ice. Uh, we could get enhanced condensation, which is the production of liquid water uh, from water vapor. And then if we have enhanced uh, condensation in a region with ice crystals, we could get also enhanced rhyming, which is the accretion and freezing of liquid water droplets onto ice crystals. And so even though gravity waves have both upward and downward motions, these changes in the upward motions could be irreversible. For example, if we produce precipitation, which then falls out of the air parcel, that would be a net loss of total water. And then also, because rhyming has no sort of unrhyming process associated with it, um, any changes due to rhyming could also be irreversible um, because we would have to convert that newly formed ice back to water vapor to get rid of it. Um, more background, we often see groups of enhanced features in radar reflectivity. So this is an animation showing a map of that in the Northeast. And I wanna focus especially on these features propagating toward the Northwest right off the coast that are typically 10 to 50 kilometers in width. And they appear like striations in the reflectivity field. They appear wave-like. Um, and so to show a still image of this, we're really focused on these groups of the enhanced reflectivity features. So in this study, we looked for gravity waves in uh, air pressure data. So to compare the waves that we looked at to what other studies have looked at in the context of like these um, reflectivity features we see. So in this table, I've highlighted my study in green um, where we looked for waves uh, with wave periods between two and 67 minutes, which corresponded to wavelengths three to 170 kilometers, which encompasses the range of the commonly observed uh, reflectivity features. And the amplitudes of these waves were anywhere between 0.5 and five and a half hectopascals, which is analogous to like climbing uh, 50 to, or sorry, five to 50 meters in elevation. And so this table goes from shortest wavelength to longest in these studies. And I wanna focus especially on that bottom example, the Bozard et al paper, where they saw a wave um, 200 to 300 kilometers in wavelength, which was associated with locally heavy snowfall. And so on the left here, I'm showing uh, the pressure trace at Bedford, Massachusetts. On the top panel is a full 24 hour period. And on the bottom, they zoom in on this big pressure wave um, which was associated with locally enhanced snowfall on the right, I'm showing the uh, precipitation contours for this case. So we know that gravity waves can be associated with locally heavy snowfall, but the question is more, how often does this occur? 
So to address this, we put out uh, networks of high precision pressure sensors in Toronto and New York. Um, these are sensitive enough, again, to detect about 0.5 hectopascal oscillations, which again is equivalent to about climbing five meters in elevation, so a very subtle change in pressure. Um, and these sensors are about the size of a deck of cards placed in the offices and homes of colleagues indoors to avoid uh, wind contamination, but they still do measure sort of the outdoor ambient changes in air pressure. These were deployed in 2020 in Toronto, sort of in the later part of 2020, in New York earlier on in 2020. So these are timelines showing when they were deployed. Um, there are some gaps due to like internet or power outages, but in general, we had at least four network or four sensors in both networks at any given time. Um, so we looked at 40 total months of analysis between 2020 and 2023. To identify wave signals, I used uh, the wavelet transform, which is a signal processing technique, which is especially useful for finding transient or time localized wave signals. So in this case, on the top panel, I'm showing the pressure time series for one sensor. And we see there's this um, temporary oscillation in the pressure um, lasting about an hour. So we use the wavelet transform and the output of that is the wavelet power showing how strong the wave signal is at any given time on the x-axis and wave period on the y-axis. And you can kind of tell from this that as we go to longer wave periods, there's a general increasing trend in the wave period. And so we account for that um, by dividing by the, wave by the average wavelet power at each wave period, which is shown in the third panel. Um, from there, we find where there are peaks uh, more than 10 times the average for a given wave period, connected regions more than five times the average, and the bounding box of that, which is shown by the magenta rectangle. And this is our event region. We can then undo or invert the wavelet transform just over that rectangle to get the, to sort of extract the wave signal associated with this wave event. We do that for all the sensors in a given network. And if an event was detected by four or more sensors, we can then um, calculate how long it took that wave signal to propagate from one sensor to the next and so on, and estimate the uh, phase velocity of that wave. Uh, for each event we found doing that, we looked at context from precipitation radar. So we identified uh, locally enhanced reflectivity features using Laura Tompkins method. In this example, I'm showing an animation of reflectivity in the top left and the detected features in the bottom left. So we're looking for where the reflectivity was relatively high compared to the background reflectivity. We also looked for Doppler velocity waves following Miller et al. Where again, in the top right, I'm showing the Doppler velocity for this case which is the component of the wind either to or away from the radar. We can find waves by taking the difference field in successive radar scans, so successive frames in this animation, and convert that to a binary positive or negative field to get the Doppler velocity wave detection shown in lower right. And so for each case, we were looking for whether reflectivity features or Doppler velocity waves um, were co-occurring with the gravity waves and also moving over the sensors in the same sort of velocity as the waves. Uh, we also looked at other weather data from surface observations um, for when snow or other precipitation occurred, as well as reanalysis model output for the broader context, like where uh, surface lows were located. Um, we also wanted to distinguish gravity waves from other wave phenomena. So our sensors would sometimes pick up a pressure shift associated with a front or outflow boundary passage. So we looked at things like radar, surface analysis, and the observed weather for context. So in this case, there is a pressure jump shown in blue, co-occurring with a drop in the temperature in purple and the dew point in green, indicating that this is when a cold front passed. And so this was not a gravity wave event. Um, whereas in this case, 
this was a gravity wave. The uh, pressure shift in blue is a little bit more subtle here, but there was no real sharp change in the temperature or dew point, um, indicating this was not a front or an outflow boundary. Um, but with other contexts, like we looked at weather balloon data for this case, we found that this was likely a gravity wave. This case is shown here for our pressure sensor data. So in each panel, I'm showing the original pressure time series in blue and the extracted wave event in black. Um, so this wave had an amplitude peak to trough of about two hectopascals, and it propagated to the northeast at about 45 meters per second, which is shown in the animation at bottom right. And bringing up that weather balloon data with this gravity wave example, we expected to see a stable layer because that is where gravity waves occur, and we did see that. So this layer um, between 1,000 and about 2,500 meters where temperature increases with height would be a very stable layer. Um, in the third column I'm showing, uh, the blue shading here indicates strong stability as well. Above that, um, we have this shift in stability, which also helps to contain the gravity waves at lower levels. Um, again, shown by the shift to redder colors in that layer um, in the third column. So in all, we found a total of 33 pressure wave events over 40 months. They didn't occur that often, at least at the scales we looked at. Um, 23 of these were gravity wave events, the rest caused by fronts or outflows or a wake low behind a thunderstorm system. And here I'm showing the number of wave events by month, and we see most of them occurred between December and May, um, when weather is generally cooler and we expect sort of stronger stability on low levels. <clears throat> this shows the phase velocity, so speed and direction for each wave event. And from this, we see, interestingly, that every single one had an eastward component to the phase velocity, um, which, isn't terribly surprising given the mean flow is from west to east um, in New York and Toronto. Um, and then we also saw most waves propagated between about 20 and 40 meters per second. These are some more examples. So these are different wave events um, from one sensor that captured each one. And I'm trying to highlight here the differences in the durations and the amplitudes of the wave events we saw. So we had some that were um, as short as two and a half, or uh, rather as long as 16 hours shown in the lower left. Some that were as short as two and a half hours in the upper right. And then there were, of course, a wide variation in the number of oscillations with each wave event that we detected. We did find a relationship between the wave amplitude and the duration of each wave event. This wasn't necessarily something we looked for, but just found. Um, and so as you increase the amplitude of a wave event, the wave event lasted for a longer duration. There is a similar relationship in seismic waves. So higher amplitude, say earthquakes, might have a longer duration. Um, and so one way we thought about this was maybe higher amplitude gravity waves have a greater upward or downward perturbation on the air parcels. So they then oscillate for a longer time before returning to equilibrium. But we don't have the means to test this. So this would be something to look at maybe in future work. We also wanna look at the context um, of the gravity wave events. Past work has suggested that we should expect gravity waves to be east of low pressure centers. And we did see that for 11 of our 23 cases. So in the top left here, uh, we had a wave event in Toronto shown by the blue dot to the east of a surface low. Um, each of these panels shows surface pressure contoured in white and the potential equivalent potential temperature shaded, which is a measure of both of the temperature and the moisture in the low level environment. So anywhere you see a gradient is where an air mass boundary or a front would be. Um, and so we saw 11 to the east of cyclones, which matches the expectation, versus just one that was to the west, which is shown here in the top right. And then we had four due north, three due south, and a few other sort of edge cases. Um, but of the ones that were either east or west of the low, most of them were to the east. 
We also looked at the upper level environments. So these maps show the 300 hectopascal geopotential height. So we're looking about nine kilometers above sea level. Um, and our expectation here was that gravity waves would be downstream of upper level troughs. And we again saw that for 13 of our 23 cases. So in the upper left here, we have a trough over the Great Lakes region with a wave event in New York to the east. We also saw six that were under zonal or west to east flow, uh, three under a ridge axis, and then one outlier case that was upstream of an upper level trough. So if we think about where we saw gravity waves in a low relative sense versus where lows track when we get snow in the Northeast, um, this map was analysis done by Laura Tompkins showing where surface lows occur, um, like the density of lows, when there is snow in the Northeast US, including New York. And so a lot of these lows track off the coast. And so if we expect gravity waves to be to the east of cyclones, if we have a low tracking in this example along the coast, as a lot of them do, our sort of favorable region to finding gravity waves should be even farther off the coast. And so we really shouldn't expect to see gravity waves during snow events in New York. And that is what we found for most cases, but I'm gonna show one where we did have snow in New York during a gravity wave event. Um, on, the on the left, rather, I'm showing uh, the radar data, including especially the feature detection at lower left. So we see a sort of west-east oriented band propagating toward the northeast. And then in this case, we had a gravity wave propagating northwest to southeast. That's going to appear here um, momentarily. So these are synced up. So we see the gravity wave occurring at a time after that enhanced reflectivity feature had sort of passed the pressure sensors and started to decay. So the timing was wrong and the sort of direction of propagation was wrong um, as far as associating the gravity wave to this reflectivity feature. Overall, this was um, really what we found overall. Um, we didn't find any cases where the gravity waves were co-located and moving with enhanced reflectivity features in snow across our 40 months of data. So three plus winter seasons. Um, we did find three cases in rain where gravity waves and reflectivity features were moving together. Um, and then we also didn't find an association with Doppler velocity waves that often. Only five out of 18 cases with echo um, had velocity waves moving with the gravity wave. And so it doesn't seem like the gravity waves at this scale um, produce a signal in the, or are associated with a signal in the radar data very often. And then if we look at when snow occurred um, in terms of the number of hours in New York and Toronto, gravity waves were much rarer than snow events. So this table, I wanna focus on the fact that we had 86 hours with gravity wave events, only 15 of those were in snow in Toronto. And that is out of 460 hours with snow total in Toronto. And then in New York, it's a similar story. Four out of 37 hours with gravity waves had snow. And then we also thought of, well, how often do snow storms occur rather than the number of hours? So there were 79 total storms, at least four hours long in our two locations and only six of those were associated with gravity wave events. So to sum up things from part one, we looked for gravity wave events on similar scales to the enhanced reflectivity features often observed in winter storms and with amplitudes above 0.5 hectopascals. So things that should be strong enough to influence the sensible weather. And we found that the gravity waves were in locations we expected um, but we did not find an association between gravity wave occurrence and enhanced reflectivity features. And we think maybe this has to do with the fact that common snow storm tracks producing snow in New York um, would not be expected to produce observable gravity waves in New York.
Okay, so shifting to part two now, we looked at the characteristics of updrafts and winter storms in terms of their strength, um, their size, and where they occurred um, within the cloud. So part of the motivation for this is that past work has uh, looked at bulk statistics of um, aircraft data, of vertical motion in cumulus clouds, but not so much in winter storms. And so these data are collected by aircraft flying through the cloud and collecting in situ observations. So on the left here, I have plots from a paper by Chin et al. showing the distribution of vertical velocity at different altitudes um, within Cumulus and Wyoming. And I wanna sort of point out the range of their values here um, where they saw updrafts in the 90th percentile, you know, three to four meters per second, which is stronger than we'd expect in winter storms, but we haven't really looked at the statistics to assess that. Before I go further with this, I also want to point out that uh, there is a scale variance of vertical velocity. And so if we average vertical velocity over broader scales, we're going to get generally weaker uh, measurements of vertical motion. So here I'm showing uh, vertical velocity measured in situ against horizontal distance for some flight leg, where we look at a 100 meter scale versus a one kilometer scale versus a 10 kilometer scale. The magnitude of the peaks and the uh, valleys in vertical velocity get much smaller as we go to broader scales. Another part of the motivation is this idea that broad scale lofting of snow particles, so 20 plus kilometer scale lofting, um, might be important to keeping uh, snow particles in cloud for longer and allowing for greater horizontal transport. So here I'm showing a figure from Lackman and Thompson, um, where I also wanna point out that their figure is on a roughly one to 16 aspect ratio. So on the left here, I'm showing what a 45 degree angle looks like on a one to one aspect ratio versus what that looks like in this figure. So just to point out that any sloped features or vertical features are gonna be highly exaggerated here. But their hypothesis on the left here uh, suggested that lofting might uh, keep snow in the cloud for longer. So the red shading is where there's upward motion strong enough to loft snow particles, which could allow for them to be transported large distances horizontally and thus fall in a different location than where they were produced. And in their sort of hypothesis, they um, had roughly a 25 kilometer wide region of upward motion strong enough to loft snow. So how strong do we need updrafts to be to loft snow? Um, these are distributions of the fall speed of snow particles observed near the surface in weak horizontal wind conditions. And we see that for each threshold of the horizontal wind they used, most of the distribution of fall speeds lies above 0.5 meters per second. And so we can say that 0.5 meters per second upward motion is needed to loft snow particles in most cases. To sort of contrast this idea of broader scale vertical motion with um, observations of winter storms, we often see these sort of smaller scale overturning generating cells near cloud top, um, which are roughly one to two kilometers across um, horizontally and vertically. And they tend to have vertical motions on the order of one to two meters per second. So this is a radar observed cross section on a one to one aspect ratio of cloud top generating cells. So on the top, I'm showing reflectivity. With generating cells, we often see um, these sort of upward protrusions of higher reflectivity, which then are connected to what are termed eye streamers or fall streaks, um, where the produced snow will then fall through the cross section and then be advected as it falls. On the bottom, I'm showing the uh, Doppler velocity, which is measuring the vertical motion of the particles. Uh, so the air motion plus the particle fall speed. And here we see some regions, sm small regions of upward motion shown in red, um, generally coupled with downward motion in blue near cloud top 
which would indicate these sort of overturning motions um, with uh, generating cells. The forcing mechanisms for this include um, potential instability, so where we have dry air over moist air, which would, of course, occur at cloud top. Um, we would see lifting of the moist air would lead to a positive upward uh, buoyant acceleration, which can then lead to overturning. Uh, latent heating is the heat released when water vapor is converted to liquid or ice. So in this cross-section of a set of simulated generating cells, um, in each panel on the bottom, we're showing latent heating. And you can kind of see these like cellular nature of the latent heating, which helps to explain why we see these cells of um, overturning motion. And then cloud top radiative, insta radiative instability occurs when uh, the long wave uh, radiation emitted by the cloud top helps to cool the region near cloud top, which can then lead to sinking and overturning. So that's shown in the top three panels here where the darker blues indicate more radiative cooling near cloud top in this case. So so the data we use um, to look at vertical velocity come from in situ measurements uh, taken during two field campaigns, NASA impacts and plows, which did a total of 42 research flights into winter storms and took measurements of the 3D wind, humidity, cloud part particle concentrations, among other things. Uh, we're looking at data at one second intervals. So we're looking at 100 meter scale uh, measurements. The measurements of vertical velocity have about a 0.5 meter per second uncertainty. So we're going to try to account for that as we go forward. And we only wanted to look at data in clouds. So we set a threshold in the cloud particle concentration of 10 to the minus three per cubic centimeter or one cloud, cloud particle per liter um, at the edge of cloud. Uh, these maps show where uh, sampling occurred in cloud. So on the left, I have impacts, which mostly sampled in the Northeast. Um, I'm only showing straight lines because we only looked at straight and level flight legs. Um, any broken lines would indicate going in and out of cloud. And then on the right, I'm showing plows, which mostly sampled in the Midwest. During impacts, we also had coordinated remote sensing data. So we had two aircraft, the P-3 and the ER-2. The idea was that they would fly roughly over the same location. So that way, downward pointing remote sensing instruments on the ER-2 could collect data co-located with the P-3. Uh, specifically, we're gonna look at cloud radar system data where the edge of echo serves as a good rough estimate for where the edge of cloud is. And we're only looking at data where the two aircraft were within three kilometers and five minutes of each other. We had a total of 19 flights with both aircraft during impacts. Okay, so this is an example of a flight, flight leg near cloud top. I'm showing four panels here. On each panel, uh, horizontal distance is shown on the x-axis. Um, so these line up with each other. The top panel shows the number concentration measured by one of the cloud probes. And so where we are above the horizontal dashed line, we are in cloud. The second panel shows the vertical velocity series and Again, I'm highlighting 0.5 meters per second, which is the uncertainty range of the instrument. So if we're above that, we are confident there's updraft. Um, the purple shading shows where uh, we have in cloud observations above 0.5 meters per second. In the third panel, I'm showing cloud radar reflectivity. So again, the edge of the echo indicates roughly where the edge of the cloud is. And the line segments here show where the P3 was and where it measured a uh, vertical velocity above 0.5. Finally, the fourth panel shows uh, the Doppler velocity, which is again, the vertical velocity of the particles, as well as the in situ vertical velocity shown by colored points, according to the legend at the bottom. Uh, these two cross sections are in a one to three aspect ratio. So again, vertical features are gonna be exaggerated a bit. So 
really the key points from this uh, flight leg, it was near cloud top, so the plane went in and out of cloud several times, um, indicated by the number concentration trace. And we had a lot of narrow updrafts, some as strong as two meters per second or stronger. In contrast, this flight leg in mid cloud showing these same four panels um, was in cloud throughout the flight leg, so a steady number concentration series. And there were far fewer strong updrafts and downdrafts in this case. So the vertical velocity trace was much closer to zero throughout this flight leg. And again, the third and fourth panels here, I'm showing uh, where the P3 flew in the cloud um, relative to the cloud top. It was about three to four kilometers below that. And so while we had cloud top generating cells in these cross sections, the P3 was well below where those overturning motions were located. Uh, this is the overall distribution of vertical velocity in cloud uh, for both field campaigns on the left. So this is the probability density or basically the histogram of vertical velocity. And on the right, I'm just comparing roughly to a cumulus study to show that in this right plot, they observe vertical velocities um, outside of this negative one to one range rather frequently. Whereas during our two field projects, um, we only saw uh, velocities outside that range three to four percent of the time. I'm bringing up the cumulative distribution now of vertical velocity on the right. So from this plot, we're showing what proportion of measurements were below a given vertical velocity. And from this, we gather only about nine percent of them were above 0.5 meters per second at that 100 meter measurement scale. To assess where we saw stronger vertical motions, we looked at things like temperature, altitude, but we found that um, the strongest trend was in the distance from echo top. So this is a 2D histogram of vertical velocity on the X against the distance from echo top on the Y. So at the top of this histogram, um, we are at echo top, and as we go down, we are farther below it. I have annotated the 10th, 50th, and 90th percentile, so you can kind of see as we get closer to cloud top, those fan out, so we get a broader distribution. Um, and we also see sort of fainter colors in the 2D histogram indicating broadening of the distribution. And so as a result, there were more observations of strong, stronger than 0.5 meters per second vertical motion closer to echo top, which is roughly cloud top. Um, in terms of ice growth, we also saw more conditions for ice growth near cloud top. Um, so this is the similar 2D histogram where, again, distance from echo top on the Y, but it's relative humidity with respect to ice on the X. Um, we have a 5% uncertainty in RH ice. So if we're above 105%, that's condition for ice growth. Below 95% is ice shrinkage. And in between is uh, within the uncertainty range. So again, this RH ice distribution broadens, but it also shifts to higher values near echo top. And so we saw more condition for ice growth uh, closer to cloud top. We also wanted to quantify how large the updrafts were. So we looked at what we term updraft envelopes. These are consecutive measurements above 0.5 meters per second. So the purple shading in this lower panel here. And then for each one, we calculated you know, how broad the updraft was, as well as uh, the upward mass flux of the envelope. So this is essentially how much air is being pushed upward within that updraft envelope. We want to account for the fact that updraft envelopes are going to underestimate the true size of updrafts. So I'm showing a cross section here where we imagine a plane flying into the page into a spherical updraft. And we did you know, a thousand random paths. The points are colored by what proportion of the actual updraft diameter is going to be measured by the aircraft um, if it passes through the sphere at that sort of point. So you can kind of see it's only when we get out to the very edges of the sphere that this ratio really falls off. Um, so it's a nonlinear relationship. This is the cumulative density of, the, of that proportion of measured over actual size of updrafts. Um, from this, we can interpret um, down here where um, we have a value of 0.1 on the y-axis. That means that 
90% of the flights will sample a measured updraft over that proportion. Or in other words, um, this ends up being about a third. So 90% of our flights will measure an updraft at least a third as wide as the actual updraft width. And so we can multiply our updraft envelope lengths by three to overcorrect this. These are the results of our envelope analysis. So on the left uh, is a 2D histogram of the uh, mean vertical velocity against the length of envelopes. Lots of points are concentrated to the lower left. So a lot of the envelopes were less than 300 meters across with upward motion barely meeting our threshold. On the right is the proportion of the upward mass flux contributed by updraft envelopes within half kilometer bins. And so this is showing us that most of the upward mass flux, 60%, was contributed by envelopes less than two kilometers across. So these lots of short envelopes contribute more mass flux than the very few broad envelopes. So our key points from part two, uh, at our 100 meter measurement scale, we only found 9% of vertical velocity measurements above 0.5 meters per second. Um, if we go to broader scales, this number decreases. At two kilometers, it was 5%, 10 kilometers, 3%. And so that, with our updraft and en envelope analysis, suggests that there's um, not really broad scale ascent, strong enough to loft snow particles occurring very often, if at all. And then we also found that more often we saw updrafts above 0.5 meters per second uh, near cloud top relative to mid cloud, which was not super surprising given that we see generating cells often near cloud top. Overall, bringing everything back together, um, in New York and Toronto, we found that gravity waves aren't commonly associated with enhanced reflectivity features in snow, um, at least at the scales that we looked at. Um, Small scale updrafts near cloud top are probably major regions, maybe the most important region of snow growth in flatland winter storms. And further, sort of the broader implication is that we're hoping that uh, the observations we've presented here can serve as a benchmark for evaluating how well numerical weather models are representing important processes in winter storms. So future work is gonna look at that as well as uh, doing further characterization of where we saw ice growth and shrinkage during impacts and plows, um, again, using the in-situ data with the cloud radar data context. And then we're also going to look at ice crystal images, like on the right, um, to see what sequences of ice growth modes are most common, which we can then draw inferences about um, the conditions these ice crystals grew in from that. I want to finish up by thanking, first and foremost, my advisor, Dr. Uter, as well as my committee members, uh, Dell, Brian, and Matt, for the very valuable feedback they've given. Uh, other members of the Environment Analytics Research Group, especially Dr. Matt Miller, who designed and built the pressure sensors, so very important stuff there for me, um, as well as providing a lot of uh, help and support with my research. Other grad students, especially Laura Tompkins and Kevin Burris, have been greatly helpful. Undergrads like Toby Peel, Declan Crow, um, have helped a lot with this work. Uh, collaborators at Stony Brook, the NASA Impacts team for um, all the hard work they did to collect, distribute, uh, process the data. Uh, pressure sensor hosts in New York and Toronto, CGA for this opportunity to be in this program. Uh, financial support from NSF, NASA, and ONR, and of course, friends and family, um, including my dad in attendance today. Thank you. So with that, I'm going to leave this slide up and ready for questions if there's any. Yeah, got a question. Uh, great job, Luke. I, I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Uh, I think the you referred to my paper with Greg Thompson and the schematic. In that paper, we sort of refuted the mm -hmm. hypothesis with the model output. Yeah. But in the model output, we saw again a small percentage of the time, but we saw we just output the upper snow flux from mm -hmm. the model, and we found that in the lower troposphere where there's really strong protogenesis. See that band of lofting. And I think 
it was a small percentage of the data points in the models are probably you know less than one percent hmm. but it was in that specific location I, I wonder in the sampling for the flights you have did you sample a situation like that in the lower troposphere with really strong thermogenesis? yeah so the question essentially was did we sort of sample regions with especially strong phronogenesis um, during the field campaigns. Yeah, kind of, um, you know, in the two to three kilometer altitude range. Yeah. Um, I'm not completely sure. I haven't looked at all of the reanalysis output to see what the phronogenesis was. Um, I would expect it to have happened at least a couple times, but I can't say it with any certainty. I think it's great that you did this observational analysis because one of the things we recommended in that paper was to go to the observations mm -hmm. and see you know, there's this ubiquitous. I think you showed it's, it's not ubiquitous. Yeah. But I, I still think the question is whether the model is representing that correctly or not. Mm -hmm. It would be great to sample a case where you could sort of catch it in the act to see is the model representing the draft and the ball velocities, correct? But the main finding of that paper really was the horizontal transport aspect, which I think is true regardless of whether there's locking. Yeah. Just because of mm -hmm. Anyway, I appreciate the analysis. Of the, yeah, happy to talk to you about it more. If you want. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, so I'm going to number one. So the gravity waves aren't commonly associated with the radar detected features, and the gravity waves are pretty rare. Yeah, but I guess the question is, do you see, I mean, the gravity waves, you can think of a gravity wave of the two jet as kind of a probe producing some vertical velocity in the, in the, the cloud. You can see how the cloud and the snow respond. Mm -hmm. Do you see detectable signals of the gravity waves at all as these come through the clouds? Um, like in the in-situ data, you mean? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure we have any in-situ data. I mean, we see, so in the remote sensing data, there are, wave motions like here in the Doppler velocity. Yes. Does that work? Okay, good. Um, so we see wave motions in the remote sensing data. I'm not fully sure how we would evaluate that in the in-situ. Um, but and we're also not fully sure whether these might be gravity waves versus Kelvin Helmholtz waves. Um, yeah, I think, especially this case um, from 2022, we saw tons of wave motions. So they did occur during impacts, but um, just not really sure how much of a difference they could make. Yeah, sure. So Lynn's question here, um, did we look at the variations of storm strength and measured vertical motion in the flight legs or whether our flight legs were close or far away from strong QG forcing? Um, well, the second part, no, we haven't looked at the QG forcing. Um, yeah, we've looked a little bit at reanalysis output, like phronogenesis and the uh, metrics for stability or instability a bit. Um, but we haven't looked at any QG forcing metrics. Uh, so that could be something we would do. Um, the variations of storm strength and measured vertical motion, no, we haven't really done that either. We've just looked at sort of the bulk um, statistics of vertical motion and where stronger or weaker vertical motions occur relative to the cloud top, but 
Um, yeah, that's definitely something to consider is which flights sampled stronger versus weaker storms. Yeah. Also to answer Gary, um, were a few flights with strong phrenogenesis. Um, can you talk a little bit about the applications of this work? Like, is this going to be important just for like commercial flights, or like what are the applications? So we're really trying to understand what is most important in producing heavy snow, um, so that they can maybe be represented better in numerical weather models. And so we're hoping that. The data we've looked at can be used to evaluate like what are the vertical motions we see in actual winter storms versus what is simulated in weather models so that hopefully that can eventually improve how well forecast models um, represent the processes so i think that's really the overarching goal of that answers so are the pressure sensors that you deployed still operating and are there plans to deploy more um, right. No. no. <laughs> Are you going to sell them commercially? Could I get one if I asked? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Actually, I had another question. Yeah, you said you just it was really nice to testing hypotheses. So this is this is cool. So I like it. But I thinking back of things were done back in Illinois years ago when I was there. Uh, did you see some really strong snow bands? In your data, and you must even if you, that wasn't what you were doing, you must when you look at one, you must think, "Gee, how did this happen?" Yeah, and <laughs> I did intentionally avoid the word snow band in this talk. I think yeah, Laura, did. <laughs> Laura Tompkins um, has done some work with comparing what we see in the reflectivities, what we see in the surface observations, and I think she found a lot of times um, you know, we see strong reflectivity bands, but these aren't necessarily directly one-to-one -one associated with um, heavier snowfall rates of a surface. In fact, right. it was really surprisingly rare that they were. That's really interesting. So with the one that you end with the volcano thing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so this was a pressure wave example. So a couple of years ago, this volcano in uh, Tonga erupted in the South Pacific, and this produced pressure waves, which were circling the earth several times, and our sensors did detect these. Um, so this is two examples of the waves that we found. Um, we saw waves propagating outward from Tonga through our sensors, as well as once they reached the opposite side of the earth and rebounded back toward Tonga. We saw that wave also. 